I'd like to wish all of you a good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim Howe. Tonight we uh, have our uh, the altruist party speaking tonight and I'm going to let Brom come up here and uh, take over in just a minute or two to explain the format and get everything underway. Brom, if you're ready, come on up. Our format is fairly simple. We uh, do announcements first, and then uh, we proceed to hear from our speaker tonight. Our speaker is Kevin over here. Uh, uh, Kevin Lewis. Right. From now, we have Kevin. Kevin Lewis. All right. All right. All right. Let's oh, welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Just whenever you're ready to start. I'm up. I've been filming since eight. All right. Well, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for coming, and especially the College of Complexes for giving me a chance to present. Um, most of my friends and family know that I've been at this since February of 2012. Um, I actually ran for president in 2012. Uh, it's all uh, date and time stamped on YouTube. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, I didn't know what homepage you wanted to show here. Just, um, just, just, just go, get, get yours up there. This is the uh, College of Complexes homepage, if you guys don't know. Um, but what we'll do is we're just going to kind of bounce back and forth between the agenda that I gave out. Who does not have an agenda? Everybody has one? Um, everything on this agenda is posted on our website. Um, I've basically been creating this website for the past five months especially just to kind of get ready for this particular um, presentation and just uh, get some feedback on, you know, here's what we're doing. What do you guys think? Um, I'm going to be running for mayor in uh, 2015 in Chicago, so I'm, I'm building a website for Illinois and Chicagoland region. So, um, But I just wanted to show you quickly where the uh, agenda is at. If you go under campaigns on the Altruist Party website, the same agenda is right there for the College of Complexes. So this paper is more just for notes and questions and things like that. So I will be asking questions throughout the presentation as well. And, but in looking um, in looking at the agenda, um, it's definitely as informal and, and uh, you know just kind of just more of a skeletal structure to keep us on point. Um, in terms of an introduction to the Altruist Party, it's really just obviously a, a longer sort of explanation throughout as you'll get the concept of mobile voting and things like that. So, um, But the, the original philosophy, the foundational philosophy is that everyone deserves an acknowledged voice. And what that means is, is that even if we disagree, and disagreement is natural, that everybody deserves the ability to vote at least once in a local or a national or statewide election, but also contribute their public opinion as well. Right now, and we'll get into it more later, there's a lot of manipulation of public opinion. There's a lot of believability issues when it comes to voting. A lot of people vote and then they go home and they're like, well, I don't know if it was fixed. I don't know how valid it is. You see a lot of ballots that go missing. Um, some get miscounted. I mean, that, that's been throughout the history of the United States. Um, there has been, of course, an evolution in the technology of voting machines going electronic, but there's still a lot of issues that we'll, you know, that we'll see. Um, but ultimately, if you're thinking about this, it's that every single person in this room, every single person that has walked the face of the earth deserves to be able to have their voice heard through mobile technology because not necessarily everybody can get up and go vote if they're disabled or if they have to work or if they're in a wheelchair or just elderly and they can't get away for whatever reason. So it's how do we actually bridge that gap using technology? So the way that uh, we're looking at it really is looking at it from a sense of public perspective is a gift. So we shouldn't really throw that away. I think if, if all of us in this, in this room were to talk about is the is the country's economy hurting yes or no i mean i think most people would look at that as yeah we're hurting right now something needs to change we need to kind of upgrade or kind of improve things in one way shape or form but in, in getting down into the detail it's not just the 
trust me, I'm your legislator sort of approach anymore. Obviously, that's not working with the shutdown. Um, what you'll see more is uh, a gridlock created from the political game. And you see that right now. The Republicans are this. The Democrats are this. And what I'm thinking in terms of the mobile technology approach is to supplement government, not replace it. Obviously, it is a republic. Keep it as a republic, but utilize mobile technology to clarify the voices of the constituents actually to their legislators. So in terms of uh, you know disagreement, of course we're all gonna disagree and this can even go to the core of keeping electronic voting or keeping uh, going towards paper voting. Um, so there's plenty of, of uh, things to look at here. Um, but in terms of disagreement, um, I think what we're seeing right now in, in the gridlock is a lot of finger pointing, a lot of political gaming, but no real educated disagreement. Nobody's coming up with any plans. A lot of people are, are defaulting to the Affordable Care Act. Calling it Obamacare is just getting suckered into uh, the, the disagreement to begin with. I mean, nobody's going to, 50 years from now, people aren't going to be calling it Obamacare. It's going to be whatever law it is. But my, from my point is, when did the public get to vote? When did the public, when did the legislators actually ask the public, what do you think about Affordable Care Act? Do you think it should be customized to Illinois? Do you think it should be a one platform system across the entire country? Do you think there should be a public option? And the public, from what I'm reading, we didn't get a vote at all. In any, any state, any virtual, like any vote, or not virtual, but national sort of vote, nothing at all. Um, the educated disagreement piece is really just looking at it in the sense of, if we do disagree, then at least come up with some resolutions for the disagreement. Everybody can bitch and moan about Obamacare this, Obamacare that, but it's, okay, well, what's your resolution? Does everybody agree with you? What's your plan? And most people don't have a plan. Most people just bitch and moan. They don't really look at what the details of the argument are. And it's really getting down to more of a drill down version, making it more educated, comprehensible for people to look into. Because right now, it's, it's just there's a lot of muck out there. There's a question? Yes. Yeah, no question now. There is no question now. Okay, I, yeah, I take questions throughout. Yeah, um, I'm from Europe, from former Soviet Union, and I have just one small comment and question. Okay, uh, no, matter how much, no, matter how much, no matter how much we will talk about, about this, whatever. So, wait, wait, wait. So, very quick. So, very quick. Okay, so I heard today, you know, from the from um, European radio, you know, in Sweden, What's your problem? Okay. In Sweden, you know, in Sweden, it's excellent medical care, and it's no Obamacare or another care. It's like very, very good in Sweden. So why we cannot slowly, I understand it's Europe, but why can't we cannot slowly listen how medical care and education in Sweden, Canada, England, France, why we cannot do slowly in lobbying like in Sweden? Because in Sweden right now is the best medical care. You, okay, you know how it's good? They pay more, they pay more um, income tax, you know, but medical care, it's very, very good and it's very, very free. I can't stand it. Why we cannot do it slowly like in Sweden? Thank you. Right. 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 <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you much. And just to show you at, at the end of the agenda, and if you can, write that question down, because it is a comparison. I know, understand the comparison. I've worked in healthcare for 15 years. So, um, but there is a time at the end for questions. So, um, but to actually get into the um, kind of what we've been doing and, and so on, um, the web page that I've been creating has, it's actually, this is, for us, it's for Illinois, it's for obviously the entire world if anybody wants to participate, and we do have some regions starting to bubble up, but ultimately it's centralizing kind of uh, what the altruist party is looking at, what I'm reading um, in terms of articles and so on, 
and a way for you to transparently communicate with me as a candidate, but also just the party in general. So if you go to the homepage, the homepage actually you'll see, this is, I've been collaborating with some IT guys in Florida um, that are kind of bubbling up some uh, conversations, but um, what you'll see on the homepage are all the articles I've ever read, probably in the past two and a half years, um, I archived them and filtered them by individual uh, sector of the government. So I just took the government manual, rearranged it, put it in an order where there's Twitter accounts so I can say, okay, if you look at me and you say, how do I know what Kevin knows? I can tell you, well, here's what I know in terms of civil rights, pretty much every single article I've ever read on civil rights, every single article I've read on the environment, on employment, on education, anything. So there's, it, it allows people to freely access Twitter and uh, basically subscribe if you are just interested in immigration information that we're following, just subscribe or click follow immigration towards your Twitter account and you'll still start seeing articles that we post. I post them every single week. This is me basically across the board and these uh, two down here at the bottom are the Florida guys that are posting uh, as well. But the purpose of this is really to provide transparency because if you would think about it, well, like, you know, what, what is the president reading? What's the mayor reading? You know, what are they following? How can I interact with them? How do I know what they know? You know, and if there's an article or something on the Swiss, you know, medical system, how do I know Kevin read that? How do I know he's even paying attention to that? And a lot of it is really, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, what I'm noticing is in the, the media world is that there is a ton of noise, right? So if somebody were to say to you, yeah, I read this article on uh, the Fukushima plant in Japan, it's, it's a bad leak, it really goes in one ear out the other. If you can say, well, actually, if you go here on the international page, you can go directly to the article and read it, and not only read it, but you can respond, you can reply to my tweet and get my perspective on it. So the um, perspective or does the party, does your algorithm's party have a perspective? It's time for questions. Absolutely. <laughs> So I don't know if I should answer that. <laughs> no, no, no. no. You that he doesn't know the system, right? <laughs> so if the moderator doesn't know, fuck it, do whatever you want. <laughs> so the way it works is if you go to the um, positions page, and this is something, again, this website is uh, only five months old. The Twitter accounts were started back in May, but 8,500 articles have been posted since. Um, the ultimate uh, positions are all, they're all listed. This is um, ultimately the guy who owns the Altruist Party domain down in Florida uh, wanted to post all of these. So they're all here. Um, but the beauty of the party is, I think, is that it's, it's, re it's realistic in the sense that you don't have to abide by a certain set of rules just to be in the party. Like you can have, as the agenda shows, you can have Democratic altruists, Republican altruists, independent altruists, Tea Party altruists. And the reason behind that is, is it actually uh, allows participation on multiple levels. So if you're, some people might not agree with our environmental piece, but they might agree with our healthcare portion. So we're not interested in excluding anybody based on their, uh, their philosophy, unless it is obviously absolutely not altruistic. I mean, if you're looking at somebody going, well, I don't think everybody deserves a vote, um, or everybody deserves even to be able to contribute to public resolution. Like if it's a street repair in Chicago, why would people not in that local area be able to vote and supply their public opinion so their legislators can help make more educated decisions? So it's, it's more of a flexible party, if you think about it that way. So we'll get into some of the other positions, but um, ultimately, they're on the website, on the homepage there. Okay. <laughs> um, so in terms of uh, going into the actual um, the, the campaign from last year and kind of what we're doing for preparing for the Chicago mayoral uh, candidacy, um, it's really getting away from more of a me versus you format. A lot of people, when you talk to them, they look at you and say, you're wrong, I'm right. Or that person, you, don't get my perspective, therefore you are wrong. 
or why should you trust me? I'm standing up here telling you I'm gonna be running for mayor of Chicago. You're looking at me like, who is this guy? I don't even know his name. I don't know where he's coming from. But here I am showing you everything that I've been building, ways to communicate with me on any topic, and transparently, I will respond, it'll be online, you know. So in terms of participation and interaction with constituents, I challenge really any other candidate out there that's doing anything remotely like this. Um, I think Governor Christie in New Jersey started a single Twitter account. Um, which has made this big splash like it's some sort of futuristic thing But I, I actually believe that you should break it down even further and go into more specifics So some of the things in terms of like civil rights um, If you go into the civil rights page, you'll see kind of what we're paying attention to and everything is uh, linked here So these are all the various um, Rights portions again. I'm, I'm building it. So it's I'm, I'm uh, working a nine-to-five job going home volunteering pretty much from like six to 11, 6 to midnight, and uh, building these things into place. Um, but it allows you really to kind of get free information uh, that's already posted out there. And I'll give you an example. If you go into women's rights, you'll see the format of um, what we're using here to kind of collect public information. So um, if you're interested in anything in terms of like, what are the current women's rights movements across the globe, you can click on that. And I'm just using Wikipedia, it's a free resource. Um, until something better comes along, if somebody wants to send me something better, um, you are more than happy to uh, email me, um, communicate me, with me, however. Um, but ultimately, I think this is kind of a, uh, where we separate from a lot of parties, is really just looking at uh, using the survey format. So if, it, if it's something related to women's rights, for instance, um, what we're asking is pretty much, what's your opinion? Here are some predominant opinions across the globe. What do you say? What's your particular interest? And then you could submit a free text if you want. Um, we're gonna build this out so it applies to veterans, so it applies to healthcare, so it applies to, I mean, anything related to uh, Native American. I mean, if it's something local, for instance, if it's something specific for Chicago, um, placing it on the AP Illinois page so you can go in, vote, comment, create new comments and new strings of comments at the bottom if you want. But it's really, we, we want your opinion. We're not interested in the finger pointing. It's going nowhere. Obviously, I'm not gonna relish in the fact that the government's in a shutdown right now. But the reason it's in a shutdown is because it's a me versus you political game. Me versus you is gonna go nowhere unless there's a tie broken. The tie breaker is ultimately the public opinion. So if we go back to the home page here, again, everything in here you can respond to. If you're interested in what's Kevin's opinion on or the altruist party opinion or what are they paying attention to in terms of climate change, it's all under environment. A lot of people, they, and to kind of go back a little bit, everything I post is as objective as possible. So I'm not going into anything that's opinionated. It's too easy to go into something that is, is, is kind of saying like, I'm right, you're wrong. That's gonna go nowhere, it's gonna become an eternal argument. If you look at something that's based on empirical measurement or something as opposed to like, uh, uh, I mean like rising sea, lo uh, sea levels, this is an article about what they're doing in uh, Amsterdam with the levees and things on the Outer Banks and things um, to control sea level rise. Um, it's, it's really kind of looking at, this is, what, this is what's actually happening right now. This is, this is a, a tangible event. It's not a Bill O'Reilly column. It's not a Glenn Beck column. It's not a Wolf Blitzer column. It's not opinionated at all. It's, this is what's happening. So if you were to read anything um, that really comes across as like too academic or I don't know, just let me know, because I, I really want to keep this as easily as, you can interpret it as easy as possible, you can respond, and it's keeping it um, pretty much um, on, a, on a layman's level. I think it's easy to kind of get in the weeds, and then people say, well, you know, you start looking at certain things with the Fukushima plant, and getting into, you know, cruelty systems and things like that, or mistakes they made, again, opinionated. Let's look at, okay, what, hap what would happen if one of the nuclear facilities in the United States broke down, how would we respond that's different than what they did in, in Fukushima? So, 
Um, I would ask any questions on the particular homepage, et cetera, but I think uh, we can hold that off until later. Um, I did want to point out that um, I, I was just reading an uh, interesting study and was told um, in the corporate world that I'm in, and I should say everything I say here is not related to anything I'm doing corporate-wise. Um, this is a volunteer political venture on my own. Um, so just to, just to put that disclaimer out there. And uh, this uh, Stanford study, what they found is, and this is kind of going back to the ultimate um, concept that public perspective is indeed a gift. What they're finding is, and even in the business world too, is that if you put diverse uh, groups of people together, old and young, different ethnic, ethnic backgrounds, um, just different departments all together, what you see is actually more innovation and creativity than you do stalemate. What they're finding is when people get involved in uh, groups that are too much alike, they, they don't innovate really anymore. And I think that's what what's happening. Yes, sir. I think that's what's happening with the, the, the Republicans and the Democrats or whomever, the Tea Party. It's, it's really looking at it and saying, yeah, I mean, if you get a bunch of people in the same room that all agree, well, if they're agreeing on something, then what are they going to create out of that? There's really not much that's going to come out of that other than just basically the same opinion. But if you're, if, if you're going to get two parties together or three parties together, just like all of us, if, if there's something on the screen, the perspective that you guys have, we all see the same thing, right? So the gift of perspective, what I mean by that, is uh, ultimately that we each have an opinion to contribute. So if it's healthcare, if it's something with the environment, like if it's a drought in, in Illinois, for instance, 80% of the crops were lost due to the drought last year. Who's coming up with plans for irrigation? Who's coming up for anything, any solution? I haven't heard anything, you know? I mean, and I'm, again, I'm reading constantly. So there's really not much that's out there. It's more of just kind of, again, bitching and moaning sort of, uh, of approach. So with that said, what's, what's kind of the point of virtual voting and public opinion through mobile technology? It's ultimately, looking at the fact that our petitions, our protests, are they effective? If we disagree with the fact that the Chicago parking system, there wasn't even any public vote on how that should have been handled, and everybody, they start raising parking up to $50 for three hours, and we go protest and bang on the, bang on the you know, city hall doors, nothing's gonna happen, nothing. I mean, it's the same thing that's happening in Egypt, the same thing that happens here, I went to an ALEC protest, same thing. You have a, a group of people that are passionate and energetic about what they're uh, interested in and voicing, but you look at how effective it is and how easily manipulated it is in terms of what the legislators can do to, to kind of deflect their public opinion. Um, that kind of moves us into the concept of the shutdown, the 800,000 furloughed employees, 400,000 aren't getting paid. Where's the platform for them to talk? Where's the platform for them to come back and say, you know what, this isn't right. Mil military veterans coming back from war, not getting benefits because of a shutdown, there should be a zero tolerance to that. But a lot of people agree with that, but you never hear the legislators actually read it. They never express it. They never talk about public opinion saying, uh, yeah, I don't think that's right either. Or it's a reactionary, which is pretty much what it comes down to. So in terms of, of uh, the, the campaign itself, it was founded on the concept of virtual voting. And the virtual vote is really coming down to the fact that pretty much everybody has a cell phone now. And if you don't have a cell phone, you deserve one. You deserve not just a phone, and I'm not talking about phone service or internet service. We'll get into that a little bit more later. But I'm talking about things like, if there's an FDA recall, and a child is taking the same inhaler that I am, and just because that child's parent can't afford a device to receive a recall to get a buzz in their pocket, their child takes the inhaler, but I don't because I got, I got one. 
right. that to me is not Thanks a lot. not Thanks. moral and it's something I think as a human right I think people deserve the right to that information um, but the ultimate thing with the campaign and why I did it the way that I did it is not everybody has the ability to purchase teleprompters. Not everybody has the ability to purchase a campaign finance manager and get TV advertisements going. So does that mean that their voice is just garbage? Like it should basically not be heard? So the reason why I did the no to low cost campaign is as an emphasis that the tools are out there. I personally believe that everybody in this room should have their own political party. I also believe that everybody in this room should have their own business. The tools are out there, it's easy. This website cost me 30 bucks to build. I'm trying to do this in the sense that if I was in a wheelchair, if I had one arm, could I do all of this? And the answer is yes. Even if I had zero money, basically. You can do all this. The tools are there. It's a matter of just learning the ability to use technology to, to amplify voices where they're currently muted in a digital divide. And, and the reason I like this picture is that it kind of shows the disconnection. I mean, imagine every human in Africa or every human being in South America having a, a way to vote tangibly off of their mobile device or learn things that we'll get into later. So um, going back into uh, the survey piece, and just go under civil rights. The ultimate goal here is to see and, and basically translate how many people agree with you. You know, so if it's something like, if I put on here, uh, do you agree that there should or should not be a public option for healthcare? Why wasn't there a questionnaire like that, even just on the internet in general, for the public to go in and do that even just on a state basis? Really not at all. So ultimately, just kind of overlooking everybody that they're trying to take care of. Yeah, we're trying to give you health insurance, but we're not really concerned with your opinion. We're not really concerned if it should be customized by state, if it should be customized by age group, you know, and sex. Everybody has different uh, health care needs based upon where they're at in life. So the goal with the, um, the survey, we'll, we'll kind of move into that a little bit more with the, uh, the Illinois piece. But the Altruist Party page, this is the ultimate sort of central portal for everything. So if you go into the regions, these are all the various regions in the world that are talking about the Altruist Party. So anything in bold, so we've got conversations in Australia, Brazil, Netherlands, Norway, United States. So if you go into the United States, the ultimate goal will be, these are things that are particular to the United States. And if you look at the homepage, it's, it's me controlling it, so I don't, I don't really, I don't get involved in what's going on in Trinidad and Tobago too much because I'm trying to maintain the accounts, all the Twitter accounts for what's going on in the US. Anything that's outside the US, I've categorized as, as uh, international. So what you'll see is, for instance, things like, you know, it'll say uh, Japan and, and talk about the nuclear reactor, it'll say something about the EU or things like that. So, so if you were to go into the um, US page, what I'm trying to do is kind of like here with the flags is, is really, I, I like the concept of symbolism and, and patriotism and pride of where you're coming from. I mean, there's so much disengagement with exactly what the United States is where we've come from as a country. I mean, I've only been around for 37 years, going on 37 years. So, I mean, I'm still learning as well. But I've been working in IT for 15 years. Um, I see a lot of gaps that are, that are open that, that would allow people to not have to go wait and stand in line to vote. Why not just be able to just get on your phone or get on some, you know, a mobile device, even if you already have it, have a government protected application where you can get on there and do it conveniently. And doing it where it's counted. Um, the counted piece I'll, I'll talk about more in a moment, but for navigation purposes, these are the two states that are uh, discussing the AP and the United States. And then uh, again, for the Illinois page, what I'm going to do is break it down for particular uh, civil rights issues for 
the state of Illinois, particular commerce or infrastructure issues for the state of Illinois, and do it in a way where, again, I can I can interact, and, and, and if it's not me, it'll be somebody else coming in line in the AP. So it's it's really here to stay, and it's it's uh, more or less moving for. Um, a very transparent, low to no cost approach that you can interact with as a, as a scenario to kind of vent your frustrations or whatever you want to do. We welcome agreement, disagreement, anything. Um, just as a show of hands, do people like this concept about Illinois? Like if you were to go into one place and say, well, what's going on with healthcare in Illinois? What's, so keep going in that direction? Okay. So again, uh, the 2012 campaign, the reason why I did it on YouTube is it doesn't really cost anything to distribute a message. So if you were to try to do the same thing, and I would certainly welcome it, about a particular issue, or if you want to run for president, do it. You know, the tools are out there. You can easily create a format where you can just forward it as simple as a link. So for the uh, 2012 campaign, which is under campaigns, You'll see all the videos I posted last year on uh, the various sections. So like, for instance, the first three posts are me basically writing speeches related to the introduction, the, the general foundational concepts of the Altruist Party, um, Plight of the American Mother. This is more towards uh, family paid leave and affordable and appropriate child care. Um, and then voter access and ballot access reform, um, really just saying, you know, are we keeping people's perspectives out of view and it's basically shooting us in the foot? Should we more or less flip the table and accept public perspective and public opinion? Have votes locally, regionally, nationally, however you want. Um, do it in a way that, again, it supplements and breaks gridlock. Otherwise, it's going to be the same old same. The debates, what I did with the debates is uh, avoided watching the debates. Um, and the reason I did that is so I could shoot off the hip exactly what I'm thinking. And the way that I did it, and you see this hat here, um, is we cut up the, um, the questions from the debates, the, the dictation from it, and threw them in a hat and just gave it to me and just gave me two minutes to answer each question. Whatever came out of my mouth was whatever came out of my mouth, but this was absolutely as unprepared as you could get on purpose. And then we had to split the debates up, as, as uh, Tim already knows, with the way that YouTube works with my account. I can't post uh, I'll show you how to post. 15, 20, yeah. But it, it's interesting that the, um, the YouTube, the, the average attention span is 30 seconds. <laughs> So the campaign will be here, everything for, and again, the reason for that is I can come up here and say I ran for president and this and that, but it's date and time stamped on YouTube and you can't, you can't change that. So. You can change it on like the inside, but um, if you were to look at the, uh, like when the video is posted and all that, it's, it's about as much evidence as I can feasibly give you that, that it happened, and that's the goal. So again, ultimately, if it's something that you like or dislike, you can go into the actual video and say, this sucks, I hate it, or hey, what about this part that you were talking about with you know, virtual voting and legislators publicly acknowledging that being a constitutional requirement that they acknowledge public opinion, um, things like that. So again, for transparency, um, but using a free platform. Um, everything for the mayoral candidacy will be posted under here. We'll also put a link to uh, Tim's videos as well. Um, petitions, again, this is something else that you can start. If you have, if you're passionate about something that's related to, I mean, yeah, obviously anything that we're talking about, but anything that you're talking about, you can easily go on to moveon.org or change.org, create your own petition, and then go into it for free and sign it. Oop, we only need 50 more signatures. So again, the um, the goal is to kind of use platforms that are already out there so you're not having to pay web developers or pay people to do anything like this. It's free. 
One thing I will point out is, um, for me, I am not accepting donations. I do not want donations. I want people to keep your money. I don't want your money. I can't stand when people ask for donations. I don't understand why there's donations if you can do all this for basically for free. Everything that I've done, like I said, probably maximum, I don't know, maybe 500 bucks total, I think. I don't even think it's even that much. Um, but, you know, a lot of people look at starting a political party or even getting involved politically as this daunting task. This task that they just look at and go, that's impossible that you can do that. But that's not the case anymore. Again, the beauty of the internet, all it takes is, hey, check out the altruist party. I heard this guy talk, just forward a link, that's free. Or just talk about it, or, you know, I mean, again, I'm not interested in the monetary aspect for political purposes or just to distribute a message. It doesn't take anything to distribute a message with the internet these days. Um, so, in terms of the, um, the campaign that, I'm, that I ran in 2012 that I'll do this year, it's really to see if it's possible to do it with a full-time job. I mean, most people look at it and say, well, how are you going to keep your job and do that? And it's almost impossible. You're going to have to give up your income, give up your, you know, your career and move into this. And I'm saying, actually, I don't think so. Because what I've been doing and my family and friends know, I, I volunteer not just for this. I volunteer on a virtual network that allows troubled teens to type in or even troubled parents to type in uh, anonymously and get clinical feedback. I have a psychology degree from the University of Iowa and I've done a lot of counseling um, throughout my life and, and it's something that that knowledge just sit there and it just collects dust. So instead of uh, letting it just kind of waste away, it allows me to do some sort of volunteerism while I'm doing this as well. And I'm, I'm pushing that every AP member has to show um, that they're volunteering in some way, shape or form. Huh. That's really the only requirement. And it can be once a year. You can do it once a year. You can do it throughout the entire year. But it's just, I mean, I think we all have a little bit of time to give back in some way, shape, or form, at least once a year. Um, so moving on into the concept of the right to virtual vote. Um, inevitably, democracy and mobile technology will meet. Where they will meet, which country it will be, who knows. But you're, you're starting to see some levels of virtual voting in New York. They're trying to push that towards um, bumping up you know, voter participation. Australia did it uh, a little bit, kind of, sort of. But the virtual vote piece here is more towards the ability to give everybody convenient access to be able to vote. I mean, there was a, what was it, a 103-year-old woman that had to stand in line for like six hours or something like that to vote. They took her up to the White House, and that's great and everything, but I'd be apologizing to her if I were, you know, I would say, I am sorry that you stood in line for that long while we have technology that you could have just voted from the palm of your hand. Um, I really at least want to push that for elderly and disabled. There will need to be some form, obviously, of public demand for something like that. I mean, I can sit up here and chirp all day long by myself, but until other people start to see that, and as the oncoming wave, especially baby boomers, everybody gets older, we're all going to get older, nobody really wants to go, you know, stand in line for six hours and vote, and maybe not even vote at all. Some people waited in line for nine hours in some places and didn't even get to vote at all. And that, to me, is a shame. It's inexcusable, especially with the, uh, again, the technology that we have today. Um, in terms of domestic issues and resolutions, um, this would be more towards the public opinion piece. But again, the concept is, is to be able, if there's something, uh, we'll just take a restaurant for example, if there's something going on in here and they're saying, well we want to, I don't know, take the wood paneling down on the walls and we want to paint it bright orange, what's everybody think? You know? That alone would show value in that individual's opinion. Most people look at their government and they say, you know what, they don't listen to me. It's an uphill battle. Nobody cares. You know, it's just a fixed game or it's a political game. It's a back and forth, this and that. Nobody really gives a shit about me. You know, and that's not true. I mean, there's people out there, I, I'm one of them. I've chatted with people that care a lot about you more than you think. And they care about your perspective 
everybody has something to bring to the table. I can bring certain things maybe related to IT or certain things in my background that I'm, that I'm familiar with, but I may not know everything about the history of, in, in a particular state or the history of you know, transportation in Illinois that I need to. I want that information, give it to me so I can help you, I can help the person coming behind me, the person beside me, whomever, so at least something in their future is a little bit better than what it is right now. And I think that's kind of where we're at. I think, you know, looking at the shutdown, the federal shutdown taking place right now, a lot of it is over this thing called the debt ceiling um, and, and relation to the Affordable Care Act, which is also known as Obamacare. The Affordable Care Act ultimately is uh, more or less a handoff, right? So there's a lot of um, hospitals that are saying, well, you know, we have all these uninsured uh, patients that are coming in and we have to write their, their care off as bad debt or charity care because they don't have insurance and nobody's going to pay us. The catch to that is, okay, well, if we provide everybody with health care and insurance and we drop the reimbursement rates, CMS, you know, Medicare and Medicaid drop their reimbursement rate to the hospitals, the, the sort of handshake there is that, well, we may drop the reimbursements, but you'll have more patients coming in with insurance, so you'll get paid. That's, that's the switch there. So I think the argument ultimately comes down to what the Republican Party is that they, they do not agree that there should be a mandate for health insurance. My question is, what does the public think? I understand what the Republicans think. I understand, you know, in terms of the debt ceiling and raising the debt ceiling and that sort of back and forth that's taking place. I understand all that, but where's public opinion in all of this? Where's public resolution in all of this? Where are people going in and providing kind of custom things that are specific to their states? You know, some states like Florida have average age of 65, 70 year olds where I used to live and I lived in Florida for eight years. Some areas that their average age was 65, 70 years old. Their healthcare needs are a lot different than South Beach. You know, how could that even apply, the, the sort of one size fits all approach? So, in terms of uh, the way that we're thinking about this, is state by state employment versus a one system platform. I think right now in the environment, if something like this were to go through a virtual vote concept, uh, it would basically be handed down and say, you use this. And then if nobody you know, uses it or people disagree with it or they, they're skeptical with it, they're gonna look at it and say, you know what, it's, it's fixed, people are hacking into it, you know, like it, the federal government, this is the way basically to kind of just really nail this all down. What I'm saying is, let's keep it state by state. So Illinois would create its own system and maintain its own system using Illinois citizens. Michigan, Kentucky, Ohio, that way you create objectivity. You look at the kinks, you look at what's working, what's not working. Each state basically, again, creates a brand new industry where jobs are created, right? That's what we need. It enhances democracy, it, it supplements it, it doesn't replace it. And it provides an opportunity for people to think and contribute to the political process. In terms of the evolution of voting, you look at, like right now, I think in the United States, there's a, there's a Gallup or Pew poll that's posted in the infrastructure areas. Um, I think about 15% of people in the United States do not have internet access. And they want internet access. They want to be able to get information but they just cannot do, they're not employed, they can't afford it, but for whatever reason, who knows what. But to me, that, again, that, that's an ultimate sort of look into the digital divide. Um, granted, you know, I, uh, I, I worked with the Lincoln Park Community Shelter and taught, um, volunteer taught daily living skills classes there for a few months. And just looking at some of the, some of the folks in there that had an iPad or had, you know, Believe me, I mean, there's, there's technology there, more than what I have. But some people didn't have anything. They didn't have a way to communicate, they were homeless and therefore not even registered to vote because they don't have, obviously, an address. 
cheesecake. And to me, that is wasting that person's perspective. They might have the most ingenious roadway infrastructure idea in the world, but how are you going to get it, first of all, if they don't feel confident to express it, or feel confident that it'll be heard in general? So with that said, the, the concept of bridging the digital divide is really just kind of like we're almost there, is lighting up areas in the United States where they're dark. You know, some areas, obviously, nobody lives there. But if you look at some of the other areas in the, in the you know, world, it, it is kind of a shame that there's all these people, but nobody's listening to them. Nobody's even concerned about what their perspective is or what they could contribute creatively to help commerce or help you know, employment or help the environment or anything like that. So if you look at um, modern voting machines and you look at kind of the last time they were upgraded, it was back in what, the 70s, I think? Uh. And then if you look at how you know, the brick phone turned into this, and some of these screens are about as big as this screen now. Um, it, it, it seems kind of peculiar, right? Like, look at how much technology has evolved on the side where it's, you know, we can order off Amazon or do whatever e-commerce stuff, you know, we can Facebook each other or whatever, LinkedIn, all this different stuff. But nobody's interested in our vote. You know, the NSA can creep in under your door and snatch all your stuff off your hard drive. They want to know everything about you but your vote. They want to know everything about you but your opinion. Seems kind of peculiar. Uh, the, paper, uh, the paper versus the uh, virtual concept, I think it's important to look at it in the sense of What's the comparison between the paper validation process and there's a question, I'm sorry. You have to wind up, you've been an hour. Oh. <laughs> no, just keep, uh, no. just finish up. we got time. Finish up and we'll take questions. Okay. Um, so in terms of, of educated dialogue, I do want to point out the fact that I have been corresponding with somebody who flat out disagrees with me flat out disagree with the concept of a virtual vote, of an electronic vote, um, and they believe that paper voting or you know, supplementing the current system is the way to go. I went from that dialogue, and I, I want to point out the Illinois Ballot Integrity Project, um, the, the guy who created that website, very smart guy, definitely something to look out for when you're looking for something with the, the uh, paper vote. Um, in terms of public opinion, the, the key to public opinion uh, voting is that it is legislatively acknowledged. Right now, anybody can ma manipulate public opinion polling and say, you know what, the polls are for me or they're against me for whatever reason. But this is something different. That allows, this is actually a constitutional requirement that they acknowledge, yes, 80% of the population wanted stronger gun control but I'm voting against stronger gun control because of X, Y, and Z. Again, right now, public opinion, people can go in the streets and protest as much as they want, but it goes nowhere because it's not constitutionally acknowledged. Additional things are things like a right to information. I mentioned FDA recalls. So imagine if, for instance, there was a health hazard locally, I don't know, a toxic spill. We all got a buzz in our pocket. That's the way it should be. Right now, we have to either wait to get home, go online, whatever, we're not sure. Financial, educational, uh, professional information, um, a lot of other things are here, but again, it's, it's kind of, again, if you think about the FDA recall format, if you're taking a medication, why should you be able to get a note, a, you know, an alert and somebody else who just can't afford technology not be alerted? And again, it's, it's upgrading that um, objective, I should say, information system. The right to personal business, this allows you to basically interact in a network on these devices or through these applications to help each other out. You know, if I need, if I'm working on a project where I need a small electrical engineer, I can't find one. Where do I go? You know, in this system, it's a one system platform that keeps the citizens of the United States together and working together and interacting together through devices that are basically as government protected as possible. 
Innovation, we'll go into uh, a little bit. Innovation right now in the United States is based on one particular one-size-fits-all patent process. So if you're submitting a patent for software, or if you're submitting a patent for, I don't know, a new, uh, we'll just say, a, I don't know, a new salt shaker or something, who cares? They go through the same patent process, even though they are completely different industries. So there's over 500 some thousand patents that are backlogged at the USPTO. And what that's holding back is jobs. If you think of all the jobs connected with new innovation, uh, sales jobs, admin jobs, you know, quality analysis, things like that, we need to open the floodgates to innovation. I think everybody in here does have a good idea. This particular system would be, uh, it would allow you to enter your idea and you could submit it and basically get a date and time stamp right there instead of having to wait for the patent office. The last thing, and this will be on the, um, the web page as well, these are current uh, infrastructure projects taking place with Chicago. And my question really is just looking at it and saying, are these the priorities that you find necessary for Chicago? And if they are, I mean, look at it, $7 billion, right? $7 billion to repair the CTA stations, create 16 miles of bus transit. I, I agree with that. Um, some of the other things, though, like the city parks, $290 million. I mean, given what's happening with Chicago Public Schools, like, I mean, can we divert some of that? You know, I mean, there's like a, a ginormous park going in in the south side. Is that really a priority when uh, we're also letting policemen go, firemen go, etc.? So the last piece um, is really just uh, motivational quotes and things like that, um, but absolutely time for questions. So um, I'm going to step aside, or Tim? Ram's going to moderate, but I got your first okay. question. So should I stay up? Or? Yeah. You stay up there because you're going to be answering this. Right. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Are you familiar? I don't think he has the first question. All right. Yeah. In your, uh, in your handout, you don't uh, describe your position on Emmanuel's uh, attempt to uh, reduce the uh, number of lanes on Ashland Avenue, or the uh, use of the TIF money for the DePaul Arena, or the, uh, uh, there's a third thing, I'm sorry, uh, oh, the speed cameras, the taking of money from uh, the poor and the middle class. The speed cameras, I've, I've um heard they're putting those in and they're taking uh, the stoplight cameras out in some intersections. Just a handful. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, with the speed cameras on, I think, what, Lakeshore, right? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely, honestly, I'm, I'm against that. I think if there's issues, if there's residents, you know, residents saying, hey, there's people running red lights, so there's people, there's two people that got hit. You know, then, then you respond with that type of, of uh, technology. I, I don't think it should be enforced really on anyone unless it's for a particular reason, right? So when it comes to like Ashland Avenue redu reducing lanes and things like that, my question is, I, you know, what technology are they using? I think if we were to sit in here and they were to go, this is why we're doing this, and they give a cheesy ass PowerPoint, you know, 55 slide deck or whatever it is, we can look at it and all together say, yeah, I don't, I don't think I agree with that rationale, or you know, I do, I understand it now. So the transparency there. You have a plebiscite at least from the people that live near Ashland. So a perfect example, and I hope that you email me because I want to put this type of stuff on the web page so so people can look and do a survey, right? Do you agree with whatever stoplights, uh, you know, the red camera lights, things like that, or speed camera lights, or whatever it is? Um, do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? What's your What's your opinion, type of thing? Um, and what was the other one you mentioned? Use of TIF money for a private uh, for DePaul for the yeah. for the arena. And is that going in um, where uh, the old Chicago Memorial or the uh, Children's Memorial? Are they talking about that area? It's It's nearby McCormick Place. It's on the South, okay, south, so it's on the, in the south, side, kind of south, south loop area. Again, public vote. You know, I need to look at, like, I, I we can sit here and talk about, like, 15, 115 million or whatever, I mean, all day long, but we haven't looked at the rationale. We haven't looked at, is it cheaper to put it in an area where that makes sense to me, which is where the old children's memorial hospital is. It's just sitting there vacant. So why not put it there, give, go ahead. 
Fullerton, yep. I, I used to live right there five and a half years, yep. Yep. So I saw I live near the Halstead Diversity, kind of uh, south of um, of Diversity, right by the Home Depot, right behind the Home Depot. I could throw a rock and hit Home Depot. Um, but please email me those questions. I want to put those on the website. Again, it's specific things to Illinois or specific things to Chicago that I think the public deserves an opinion on. So, okay. Yes, Tim. Have you ever heard of the government of Estonia? and their e-government initiative. No. You should take a look at it because what it is, it's a uh, completely, uh, they were probably the first government to do this virtual voting thing, the whole bit with the e-commerce and the mobile identity and everything else. What you're talking about was probably done within the first, for, for the last six or seven years in the uh, government of Estonia. Yeah. Does, do the legislators acknowledge public opinion? Yes, they do. And how you is vote, that? Um, you vote. There's things. Like, I'm not too sure about how the system works itself, but I do know you get your driver's license, you get all your government services. Most of it can be accessed either through a web browser or a mobile phone. Yeah. And most of the government workers use the internet as a portal to keep, you know, to go paperless. I'll look into it. <laughs> Take a look. You might find it interesting. Absolutely. Thank you. Margaret Aguilar. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll just ask two right now. What did you do in health care? Did you work in health care for five years? What, what kind of a position did you have? And why did you choose Twitter? <clears throat> so the, the health care positions that I've had, I started at uh, 22 years old. I started working with electronic health records. You let it hear them as EMRs, electronic medical records. Um, what I did is I was a project manager. I basically flew around the country and helped doctor's offices convert from paper charts into these EHRs. I did that for about six, seven years of my career. In the last six or seven, I've been working on the uh, more the business side of healthcare in medical supply chain. So what I do is I'll, I'll help hospitals look at their purchasing patterns and say, for instance, if it's you know a restaurant here, you guys buy all these glasses from five different suppliers. I think if you you know like if you bought them all from one supplier, you could lower your price, therefore save the hospital money, therefore not have to fire FTEs. Yeah, and then the other the other one um, you had mentioned healthcare, and then what was the other one? Why oh, Twitter? why Twitter? Twitter because it's free and it's the largest network in the world. It's already it's already established, and it allows like again if, if there's something that I posted and you're like Kevin, what's your opinion? If I, I'm, I'm going to look for things on Estonia, um, you know I post it on there. You can respond to it. It's transparent, right? And I can respond to it back, and you can say, "This is there's Kevin talking right there. That's what that's his opinion, you know." So I think I'm not hiding behind anything as much as making it as, as really as transparent as possible using a free network that's already the largest in the world. Okay. Next question. Questions. Question. Charles. And we get all kinds of recommendations from the public. Orally, I've sat through them. Most of them are, are goofy <laughs> and nuts and a waste of time. Yeah. And we have transportation experts. And we deal with IDOT. Like you're saying, IDOT. There's some homeless guy who knows what I got the Illinois Department of Transportation should be doing. Well, I mean, you got to look at it. There's always going to be the, I mean, the fringes. Stuff that yeah. We, I just try to be diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, look at it. They're nuts. Yeah, so... And you want... What do you, you want to collect all these? Well, and first of all... What are you going to do with them? First of all, if you look at it, it's, it's really, it's, it's organized information collection, organized data collection, in the sense of, okay, yeah, there might be people out there with crackpot positions, but that, that's going to become known, it's going to manifest itself right away, so it's not really saying, okay, if you're going to put up an idea, it's going to go on this list of a million different concepts. 
if you think about it in the sense of a public opinion vote, obviously the ones that come towards the top, you could say, okay, there's going to be a week that we can vote, or, a, or two weeks, and we can all vote you on these. People to vote on public transportation. Absolutely. Why should they not be able to? Because they don't know anything about it. But if you look at so like the, the, the same, the, the, what do you know about BRT? About public transportation here? How much does the BRT cost per mile? I don't know. You're gonna vote on it though. Now, I mean, again, the education piece, so like my, the, the argument would be on your side is people don't know anything. The argument on my side is, well, bring it to the palm of their hand so they do know it. Bring it, bring, bring it to the palm of their hand so they can go to the public transportation website, read on it. 500,000 um, riders on public transit. Am I, what, how am I going to bring it all to their hand? Well, first of all, a lot of them have, a lot of them already have cell phones, so you can easily create an application and distribute it just like any business would distribute it to any number of employees, right? So if you were to do like if if the the public transportation board was interested in public opinion on certain things, they could send out a survey, a quick survey, or whatever one polling, however they want to do it, and collect public information that way, where it's organized from an educated origin rather than just people kind of flippantly writing in, I think we should make flying cars instead or something like that. A lot of a lot of that stuff will remain on the fringes, will be cut out immediately. I mean, you can see it. People would have, for instance, maybe a, an account where they could say, yeah, there I did. I submitted my flying car idea, but it didn't go anywhere. You know, but the, the main thing is, is to be able to collect views, 500,000 public writers, you said, What's the percentage that all agree should go, you know, PRT should go this way versus that way? You know, and I think when it comes to legislative deadlock and trusting these legislators when they come to this me versus you finger pointing, it's saying, well, what's going to break the tie? And what's going to break the tie is constitutionally acknowledged public opinion. So if it comes down to two choices that PRT has, then basically, again, you're going to either get locked in a gridlock, a duopoly gridlock, or you're going to have something that says, okay, 90% of people think we should go this way, so therefore we're going to go this way. What is the, I won't go on, what's the value of opinion of someone that they don't understand it or know anything about it? Well, Chuck wants to have a discussion okay. with you. Again, it's, again, it's ultimately providing value never, in their perspective. Everybody's, no moderation here. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I have. Yes, uh, Mike, you already more. have your question and your opinion. If you want my opinion. One fool at a time. I want your opinion. What's your take on this? <laughs> I don't know the Okay. Mike, what I want to ask I, 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 I will answer. I think that your proposal of having more input, opinions, into <coughs> what Mr. the Mr. Aguilar, people you're not Mike Whitford. I just recognized Mike Whitford. That's right. Switchboard. Back, uh, Mike. Uh, I've never heard of your party, but um, you shouldn't have. It's only been yeah, it's not been around. How many years? I started in 2012, uh, February, and again went with absolutely zero self marketing. Um, did anything like I would tell any friend of mine. Go chat with people that you feel are wise and just kind of bounce it off of them. And so I sent it to a lot of professors and people throughout the United States and then got feedback on it and, and just kept going with it. So I started the health party in 2004. I ran for president in 2004. Good for you, man. That's a health party. Are you? Yes. What's your question, Mike? Are you, is that a question? Are you going to address the leading cause of death in the United States? And you know what it is. Well, I mean, you can look at it in different statistics. It can be uh, basically car accidents, suicide. You go, you go to your internet there and put leading cause of death. I'll help you. The leading cause of death is medical errors. Yes. Medical diag like diagnostic errors or just treatment errors? Medication, yeah. med sores, outpatients, 800,000 deaths a year. It's not supposed to be answering questions. It's supposed to be asking questions. 
You had two questions so far. All right, Frank. Now is my uh, time. E email me. I'm trying to follow the format. Uh, or can we talk afterwards? Will you be here? Of course you can talk. He will bend your ear any way you want. Right. Uh, um, your proposal of having people tweeting their opinion in whatever issue is, I think, is very, very valid. Uh, the majority of the opinions will be in the in the bell curve on the right position, and the outliers will be coming with flying cars or, and whatnot, yeah, uh, nuclear nice. power airplanes, and so on. But. Uh, I, I think that this could be implemented uh, and, and realized that it will be very good. But when you're talking about voting through the, and knowing what our government is doing with information and, and putting, uh, you know, spying uh, programs into our computers and all that, I am afraid that that could be dangerous to distort the reality of what happened. And with the machines that they were electronic, uh, voting machines that was totally corrupted yeah. it was it was uh, the programs were uh, and your question is and your question is no he asked me oh, okay. what my opinion was about his proposal and i am answering he to didn't that. answer it yeah yeah now well, people are not really listening well. here they are just well, bothering and you're it's organized listening that's the goal Right. So, uh, Margaret has a second question. Oh, and did you have Rihanna. a Jean, Do you have a question? I, I, no, I've Jean already asked her question. question. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. and then, uh, yeah, I, I didn't quite understand when you said you you ran for president. Was it? I, I don't know if it was a virtual run or an actual run. If it was an actual run, uh, how many? Uh, you have to get petitions in each state. So. Did you get on the ballot? How many states did you get on the ballot? And how many total <laughs> votes did you get? Zero. If you, if you ask me, um, I'm not, I, and part of my philosophy as a candidate, I can't vote for myself either, so. Um, so zero votes. Um, the, again, the concept is low to no cost. So obviously competing with multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar, whatever, super PACs that can get you know, who knows how many commercials and things on TV. Not everybody in this room has that money to do that. So, again, going toward it from the approach of, if I, if I came, you know, back from war, I was in a wheelchair, I was maimed, could I do this with no, no money? The answer is yes. Now, whether or not anybody's listening, or whether or not the ballot uh, access process needs reform, and it's basically, it's, it's a, a game of loaded dice. That's ultimately what it is. Thank you. Uh, ben Weinberg. Yeah. Uh, your, your, your opinion of getting everybody's opinion is very nice. Uh, Rahm Emanuel took it already and he's done it. He's had uh, forums, public forums, and he got everybody's opinion. So how are you different from Rahm Emanuel? Well, <clears throat> the difference is not everybody was able to attend those forums. That's assuming that everybody got in their car, didn't have to, didn't have to work, you know, was able to come back and, and actually take place. I didn't hear about that. I've been a resident of Chicago for one of six years now. I never even, never even heard, never received an email, never received a phone call, you know. So I think a lot of people in those particular forums, I think they, they excluded a lot of people either unknowingly or knowingly. So I, I, I think it's an incomplete data set ultimately. And I have a follow-up question. Sure. How do you expect, you, are you serious? Are you seriously think you're going to win with spending zero dollars? Um, I don't, it doesn't really matter to me. You know, I mean, right. I, again, I think, I think ultimately, if you, if you look at money, uh, it's going to undermine everything. You know, if you look at it in the sense of it's going to take money to win, then you've already lost. Money is the root of all this. Uh, Okay. My question is, what do you think about uh, coming back to health in Europe? It's like three in Sweden, England, France. Yeah. So what's your opinion? How about to make slowly, same like uh, healthcare education in this country, but slower? Because I understand the design 
capitalistic way to, you know, like a different way. Yeah. So I think there's two things going on when you talk about nationalization of healthcare. In the United States, we are extremely good at specialized healthcare. But in terms of like medical errors and things like that, they're still taking place. A lot of medical errors, as you know, are due to legibility issues. You know, I can't read this prescription. I can't read the doctor's writing. You know, so one of the goals is to implement electronic health records as a way to decrease medical errors. They're also finding things right now as the EHR default settings are causing medical errors and they need to change things like that. But you think it's possible? It's Absolutely, yeah. I mean, ultimately it's preventative medicine. So you look at what's preventative. What can I do when I go home to take care of myself? So like if you're looking at um, part of the, the, the application would be more or less showing your risk for diabetes showing your risk for COPD, you know, whatever whatever particular thing that, you know, is related to a BMI or anything. It's providing information for people to be able to take care of themselves at home. Um, but in the, preventative, in the preventative setting and what they're finding with things that I'm reading is the United States, the, the core healthcare system itself, when it just comes to like basic things like I have a flu, I'm going to go to the hospital. That's where a lot of the issues and wasted costs take place. But if it's something where I need cancer treatment, you have kings flying to the United States. People don't want, I mean, not knocking what's going on elsewhere in the world medically, when it comes to specialized medicine, the U.S. is still like bar none compared to everybody else. But when you look at preventative basic medicine, I got a cough or, you know, like whatever, I've got the flu. That's where we could do a little bit better, obviously, in terms of comparing, like, how are we doing it here versus Sweden, et cetera. So, but medical error-wise, um, I, I do think EHRs are helping that. But I do think if you had on your phone, for instance, um, here's what happens when you have an allergic reaction, or here's the difference between an allergic reaction and, you know, just like, you know, like a food intolerance or something like that. Um, I think that information is very objective. I think we could all have it. I mean, if you think about SIDS or suicide risk or things like that, it's, it's not right that just because I have information to the latest and greatest information on maybe like asthma, that a mother with a child with asthma doesn't get a, a, a new update because she doesn't have the technology. Uh, yes, Mark. Hey, he already had eight questions. Uh, <laughs> I welcome. I wish we had more time for your questions. Oh. Uh, oh. By the time an hour passes, you'll be, you'll be Is done. Is there somebody who didn't have a question? No, I just, uh, no. Okay, no. good. What I wanted to ask you was. Um, how are you are you going to have the government buy phones for everybody is that the deal and pay for phone service or yeah i mean it's not as much um sorry i interrupt no no go ahead. um you know you look at it's it's not phone service for us to be talking to each other it's it's not uh internet for us to be getting on facebook and stuff like that i think that stuff a lot of the isps you know i mean that those platforms are still there um, I do think in terms of manufacturing and things like that, I, I do think it will take cooperation, but I'd like to keep it in the United States. Of course, we can't get all the pieces, all the, the devices and things like that from just the United States, but um, do it so it employs people in the, in, in, this, in the country. And ideally, honestly, I mean, jealousy, envy is a good thing if other countries look at us and say, those guys got it right. They collect all their people's opinion. They collect everybody's votes. They do it in an organized fashion. The legislators have to acknowledge it. So protests are really absolutely last resort. Um, and it's all transparent. Even if you guys, if I'm disagreeing with something, I have to say 90% of the constituents disagree with me. Here is my rationale against that. And face the backlash of that and get kicked out of office or whatever, however it happens. But um, I do think manufacturing-wise, we'll need cooperation. Um, the gap isn't that, it isn't that great to fill, but I think it can be filled very cheaply. I mean, you look at like things like Cricket and other phone services that they're they're cheap, but they're not as they're not these robust things that I'm talking about. You basically have a communication system directly with your government and then a network within to interact with each other in case, you know, I need two or three people on a job that maybe electricians or uh, engineers or something, and I can quickly find them in the, in the location that I'm in, things like that. But, 
It will take cooperation from manufacturing. Yeah, I, Kevin, I do a monthly report on the legislation pending in the U.S. Congress. There's about 2,000. You could narrow that down to the hot ones. But then again, you have three levels of government. And I don't really understand is the individual citizen supposed to... And then there's... I'm getting there, Phil. Then there's appropriations. How does the individual citizen uh, make any assessment of all this? Well, uh, go ahead. You, it's, what do you expect people to do to formulate any opinion of any value? So I think it's it's really like, stuff, yeah. Uh, it requires congressmen and staff who are assigned even specific areas, mm -hmm. and even I'm, but they're a specialist. Even. But now you're saying that Joe Citizen, it's very commendable for this democracy. I'm getting there, Doc. <laughs> when are they going to do this, or how? So the perspective that I have is is people that are notified if there's a resolution taking place they're notified because they subscribe to it. For instance, like if I'm only interested in environmental things taking place in Illinois, I'm not even going to get a notice unless it's environmentally related. If it's public transportation, I can easily do that. But just if you divide the 2,000 resolutions or 5,000 or however many there are, and you break them up, they are pertaining to certain sections, of course. You know, I, I don't know if there's 2,000 resolutions on public transportation, that would explain a lot of gridlock, but in looking at it, again, it's, it's not being threatened, it's just saying, let's open a portal to collect public opinion instead of nothing at all. You know, but again, in those resolution pieces, if I were to say, yeah, I, I would like to participate in public resolutions for the state of Illinois, and then you just check whatever you want, you know, check health care if that's what you're interested in. If that's the only thing you're interested in, you would only get notifications when there's resolutions related to health care. And I vote on it? And you can go in and, su and submit your opinion. So, I mean, it's, it, it would be similar to the, um, I don't think it fell offline, but like similar to the women's civil rights thing. So you would get a notification to go in, yeah, there's something so in. in my opinion to whom, and I'll leave it at that. Your legislator that you, that you voted for, yeah. I do that now. <laughs> uh, but I mean, is it organized? Is it? Yeah. I mean, you have a special position, right? You have a you have a voice that that I even don't, that most people don't. You know. So again, it's it's saying why be afraid of public opinion? Question. Uh, Margaret. Um, you sound like you want to uh, you know, if by some miracle uh, you would be elected. You sound like you want to run the run the city by voter or by people mandate, so that you would do whatever the majority of the people wanted you to do. So you wouldn't have to do anything really. To you wouldn't have to do any real work. Yeah. Well, I think that's I think that's the classic explanation of what's the difference between a democracy and a republic, right? So, like the republic, we live in a constitutional republic. So the idea is, just like the purpose, why did they come up with electronic voting machines? Same, same reason, um, is to obviously make it more efficient, make it more reliable and believable to collect public opinion. But I do believe the legislators that are voted in office, they are the ultimate decision makers, they are. And that even though I would, you know, for my constituents, and, and if uh, Charles had his own constituents, you know, that disagreed, Charles and I would have to ultimately, as legislators, lead in terms of saying, you know what, this is better for the 50-year plan of Chicago or whatever. It's still, it's supplementation of government with public opinion. It's not turning it into a democracy. It's basically supplementing it in cases where it turns into a gridlock situation like it is. So then what are your qualifications for being in office? Um, I'm a citizen. I mean, ultimately, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I, my challenge, my qualifications is, um, you know, just like if you were to go and, and ask anybody, I could sit there and tell you all the experiences I've had, 15 years, you know, working in a corporate setting, working with IT, 
you know, I've lived in what freaking eight different states now. You know, so I've had exposures. I've lived overseas. I've worked with the military. I'm working with the military right now. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of it again. It's I'm more than happy to have those conversations, but again, I think that's kind of an open-ended kind of, I could sit here, you, you could talk to Janet Yellen, the new Fed Chair nominee, and some people will find her not qualified enough. Compared to the Congress we have now, you are super qualified. Right. Thank you. There is nothing worse than what we have now. All right. Then run for office. Or have we run out of questions? Yes. In that case, we're going to the rebuttal period. Okay. So I should just, just leave, leave it up. Leave it up. All right, let's thank our speaker. Thank you, thank you. All right, let me get back on my. I did uh, my Verizon. All right, in the rebuttal. How many of you? Uh, no, have American Mike. Yeah. Opinions to offer. We have. Did you get uh, up my email? Here. Two or three of us. Yeah. Uh, so. If you see the SYP in the top right hand corner, you can see the uh, uh, share your perspective. Uh, so it shoots directly to my email. Only five, six. Thank you. Seven. Eight. Eight people were willing to uh, give us uh, uh, the benefit of their knowledge. Uh, we'll go easy. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know if I'm. Is it okay? She's not. At least. Uh, Tim Bolter will be uh, time. How much time for now? We got a lot of time. Five minutes each. Six minutes. Six minutes, okay. Yeah. Oh, hurry up. Up to six minutes. <coughs> we'll have to go to six Take minutes. Take as much time as you want. But <laughs> if you go beyond that, you're trespassing on some other speaker. <coughs> oh, no problem. Also, right. as fast as this goes, uh, and our first lucky speaker will be Tim Bolger, followed by Mike Whitworth and Doug Binkley and Gene Horker. Um, all right, while we're waiting, for the network to connect. What I wanted to give is, the first thing I want to tell you as a speaker, you need to get to a Toastmasters club. Toastmasters. And it's, it's only because it's an organization that helps you get more concise and more information in. And I have to applaud what you're doing and the concept behind it, but a lot of what you're talking about is already being done. You know, LinkedIn, for example, is one one site that does it. Uh, others are in there. There's already, these legislatures already have a lot of this information on what you're thinking and what you're feeling. If you've ever heard of a company called Axicom, A-X-C-I-O-M, the largest data aggregator in the world, what they're going to do basically is uh, take four of it from here. Now, while we're on that same subject of availability, there is a um, there is a way to access these old college videos. Right here's our College of Complexes homepage. Um, as soon as I get back, and what I want to do, all you got to do is you take a look at this camera right here. Videos of previous programs. It's going to click you right to a site. That's my own website. Take it down here. We go back to 2010 with a few videos. There was a little bit of a gap in these video presentations. You go to 2011, you have a number of months up there. I, I got everything on the computer, but I still have to basically upload a lot of 2010. Now, as you go up more into the basic site and the construction of it itself, you go into 2012, you'll find that the dates are rather consistent. Let's go to April, May, and June. You're going to find all of our talks. Now, there was a couple where there were none available. Either I wasn't able to make it or our speaker did not come in. 
But for example, if you go down here to the... Uh, That's not a rebuttal. Well, Frank, you know, it's it, you can speak about anything during the rebuttal period. Yes. And frankly, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, this is important. People are trying to get this stuff in. So, um, as you can see, uh, there's a lot of things up there, and the way to do it is you just click on it. It takes you to a. Uh, site called YouTube where I have my accounts up here for example and then all you have to do is you can see it there now I gave a lecture how come it's not on the list uh, which one Charlie <laughs> which one on the innovative products uh, probably because transportation of the future um, oh, I, think, on, I think it might be up there now what was the date? Let's take a look at the know. date. Don't bother. Well, most of them are up there. And as you can see, you can also download quite a bit. So I, like the speaker, have had a lot of experience with posting things up on the Internet. The other passion that I have with this same website is if you go up here, and the reason I mentioned uh, things like Toastmasters and things like this, is most every site today has something in there. I have several forums of public speaking available that you can go into, 2013, and this is just all a passion that I do. And you can see it there. Now, the other thing that I am very involved with is my own um, church. At the, I'll show you that site real quick. But I guess I don't have to. What I'm trying to say is that Please he don't. is right about information. It is almost free or cheap to distribute. And over the last three or four years that I've been doing this on my YouTube account, there's about 45, 50 subscribers right now. And in the, with the fact that it's there, you know, I don't necessarily venture a lot of opinions, except that this forum and they're formatted. But you guys can do this too with a little education. It does take time though to do the passion. For example, once this item goes down, it'll go home, it'll take me about 15, 20 minutes to upload to the computer. I have to run it through an editing program to clean it up and then get some of the editing out. And then after that, it takes about two to three hours to post up on YouTube. Now, YouTube only lets you normally do about 15 minutes worth of average uploading time, but there is a way to get an account for up to 12 hours. It's kind of buried in there, but what they want you to do is prove who you are, get a mobile phone identity, and have to talk to a human being as to why they're going to give you the account. Because of the things I do at Toastmasters in here, they were able to approve it. I was able to upload everything up to 12 hours in length, and that's how it goes. So there you have it. Maybe not exactly a rebuttal, but a lot of information on how you can find out these past presentations. Anything up here you can link to, you can take a look at. That's all I have to say for tonight. Yay. Are we on a timer? Or no? Well, yes. I'm going to be timing with six minutes, Mike, if you can, but I went a little longer because it was more. That's okay. That's fine. Just go ahead and we're, 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 we're loose. We're loose. This is the front end, so, you know, you got a lot of speakers behind me. That's fine. And it's good to be here again. I've uh, been real busy, been out of state, and I'm leaving for Ecuador on uh, the 26th of October, for about five weeks down there. I'll be teaching, treating, training uh, the third world country on uh, some of the techniques that I've used that are thousands of years old, like reflexology, uh, some of the more recent stuff like myotherapy. And uh, it's a very, very rewarding uh, five weeks that I'll be down there. This is my fifth trip to, trip to Ecuador. I've been to Haiti a couple of times, Canada, Norway, Australia, Puerto Rico, sharing wellness. As I mentioned earlier, and I'll be talking to Kevin after the program tonight about something that's real close to my mind. Back in 1965, I was headed for Vietnam and was traumatized in a testing center after trying to stay awake for eight days. 
I was so excited about getting to Vietnam because us baby boomers were going to make that the last war. Well, you see what's going on now with the Bushes and the Cheneys blowing up the buildings and then starting Afghanistan, Baghdad, Syria, Libya, uh, all these fronts that they're, that they're goofing around with to keep this money train going, like with Halliburton, multi-billion dollar operation of enriching Mr. Cheney. Well, I'd like nothing more to see him and Bush and um, Rumsfeld hanging from a gallows at the base of the new 9-11 building down there that they blew up for big insurance fraud with the Silverstein. Is it going to happen? Maybe, maybe not. It seems like Mr. Obama thinks that uh, 19 box cutters somehow blew up three buildings in New York, uh, put a pencil in the Pentagon and a garbage dump in Pennsylvania, and uh, 300 million Americans are supposed to swallow this piece of garbage. Well, I, my thought on this is that if they can lie to the entire world, seven billion people heard about 9-11 in less than 24 hours with the internet and all the drum beats and everything else, that something had happened in New York, and they expected seven billion people to swallow this lie, Evidently, we can say anything we want. If the government can lie to us, that means I guess that we can lie to anybody we want to, okay? Now, I base my stuff on research. I'm a researcher, a medical researcher. I've been doing this now for close to 15 years. i had a tremendous amount of success. One of the things that's on the internet is um, death by medicine. I knew this is what I quoted earlier. Every year, there's a genocide occurring here in the United States from licensed doctors, hospitals, insurance companies, okay? 800,000 doctors kill, and the medical uh, group kill 800,000 Americans every year. If you do the math on this, okay, it's 2,200 Americans a day die in the medical field from medical errors, too many drugs, wrong drug, wrong patient, wrong blood, wrong surgery, whatever it might be, okay? They're dead, they're real dead, okay? My mother died a couple years ago, she was 97 years old, she was drugged the day that she died, okay? And if I could have stopped that, I tried to stop it with my brothers and sisters, they refused, okay? My dad just turned 94 this year. He's never taken a pill in his life, but with the stress, and I work with a lot of research on stress, um, he's lost his mind. He doesn't know that I'm his oldest son. He doesn't remember his current wife. My mother, he doesn't know who she is, my sisters and brothers. He has no clue who they are because of stress. I put a brochure up here on stress. You can take a look at it, take a copy of it. It's a very inexpensive test you can take. And the answer to stress reduction is in this brochure also. So it's good to see you all again. Um, I'll stop by again one of these days. God bless you all. Next. Yes, my name is Doug Binkley. Uh, some of you know that uh, I worked in with politics uh, back in the uh, um, late 70s and 80s uh, with the Citizens Party. Uh, this was a party similar to what the Green Party is today. Um, so you can guess where my politics were at and they still are at. Uh, uh, I'd like to commend the speaker uh, for trying to uh, uh, put together a new party. The Altruist Party is a great name. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe we should have used that instead of the Citizens Party. I don't know. We might have had a little more success, but uh, we ran very common uh, environmentalist uh, and only got something like a quarter of the percent of the vote in 1980, and we self-destructed running uh, Sonia Johnson. Uh, although she was a progressive, uh, uh, self-destructed and got almost no votes in 84. Now, um, I want to uh, um, mention uh, in regards to this technology, um, now, I'm a, I'm a proponent of technology when it works. I'm a proponent of uh, scientific solutions to things. I was trained as a scientist. I have a bachelor's degree in physics from the Illinois Institute of Technology. And uh, 
Um, but uh, I'm very disturbed by this um, confidence that technology can be used for voting. Um, we all know that uh, in 2004, uh, there was a close election. Uh, Pitt, uh, Kerry was running against uh, George W. Uh, Bush, the less Bush the lesser, as we may call him. Um, and uh, that uh, the exit polls all show that Kerry was uh, up by three to five points in the uh, crucial states. Um, these exit polls were then suppressed and when the votes were supposedly counted um, in states where there were a lot of uh, electronic voting machines, um, suddenly, somehow, uh, George W. Bush eked out a victory. Uh, Ohio was the critical uh, state uh, where he barely managed to uh, save his skin, as it were, and uh, the skin of the neocons. Uh, but um, there are many uh, uh, investigations that show that it is very possible that that was a fraudulent victory. So that was uh, because of the number of electronic voting machines in Ohio and other states where they did not have a paper trail. Or if they did have a paper trail, there was no insistence that there be an examination of the paper trails um, of those machines. Now you know that we have electronic voting machines in Illinois. Every time I use one, I've noticed that there is a paper um, uh, strip that goes alongside. Of course, uh, any of you that use them, make sure there's the paper strip and to make sure that it, it registers the votes, at least the important votes, that are accurate to what you um, uh, checked in the, um, in the check boxes. Although, uh, uh, God help us if uh, enough of us see that, that they're wrong and complain and then they don't do anything about it and no one ever, you know, because that could happen very easily. But, uh, you know, presumably we are safe as long as there are these paper trails. However, I'm not sure about that because I, I suspect uh, that they still could be used fraudulently uh, uh, for, to steal elections. Uh, we, we're pretty sure that uh, George W. Bush uh, um, probably did not actually uh, win that election in 2004, uh, but some of those problems were fixed in 2008 and they weren't able to steal the election from McCain. Um, now, so for any kind of virtual voting, I mean, something like that, um, if you're maybe talking about a plebiscite, of something that's not that important. Uh, it might be okay to use it as an advisory thing, uh, like for this Ashland Avenue uh, stuff, this nonsense that they're trying to shut down two lanes of traffic and cause uh, environmental damage by having bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic and cars, you know, stopped basically, or maybe moving over to Western and moving slow on Western and using up gas and causing damage to the environment by their stupidity. They've had... Um, uh, these so-called public uh, discussion things where people come in and tell them how stupid they are and they just go on and it's reported in the Tribune that, well, they still seem like they're willy-nilly going to go ahead with their idiotic ideas. Um, so for a plebiscite of that nature, perhaps virtual voting would be okay, but any kind of this suggestion to be nipped in the bud of virtual voting on the Internet for any important elections like for president, congressman, uh, metropolitan sanitary district, or dog catcher, any of that kind, any important elections like that, you should not have virtual voting. The internet should have nothing to do with it. They should be paper ballots like they are in Canada, uh, so that they're uh, just simply paper ballots, uh, counted perhaps by machines, but at least so that in a recount, uh, individuals could make sure that those ballots were actually properly uh, counted uh, in case there's any kind of a close election. Uh, because paper, as we know, you can't just go in and digitally change uh, when someone has checked a box um, next to their candidate. And uh, it's clear when you have a paper ballot, and it's very hard for somebody to do a trick like the Buchanan uh, ballot in, uh, in 2000, uh, which stole the election for uh, uh, George W. Bush the first time, inadvertently, it maybe wasn't intentional. We can't prove it was intentional, but we know that those votes were um, not for Buchanan, but they were for Gore. I'm just reminding people of history, which uh, is relatively recent, uh, so that you don't get carried away with uh, nonsense, absolute nonsense, uh, which has been proven, actually. There were experts involved in uh, um, a, uh, several studies, but uh, one in particular, I can't name it exactly, but where there were computer experts that said you should never, ever trust the voting system to electronic voting machines in the first place, but certainly not ones that don't have a paper trail, and certainly not to anything on the internet. Um, things can be hacked. 
things, digital, um, digital things on file can be changed. And if they're changed, sometimes there's no record of them being changed. So you would never know that the election was stolen. Now, as far as, the, as, far as running against the manual, uh, I would vote for anyone against the manual, even uh, the devil himself. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we all know Emmanuel is such a great politician. If the devil was running against him and he knew he was losing in the polls, he'd put up bells above to split the, uh, the uh, uh, satanic vote. Okay, thank you very much. Next. Thank you, Doug. Gene uh, Walker and then uh, Dave Travis. Well, technology. Um, I read a book by Morris Berman. Uh, why America failed. He didn't say America might fail. He didn't say America could fail. He said why America failed. And part of his uh, critique had to do with technology. Of course, I like that book because I myself are, am incompetent in technology. So I'll have to admit that. But boy, you have to watch very, very carefully because I've seen people with technology riding in their cars, talking on a phone, or walking across the street into traffic with their telephone. So you really got to watch that. Um, the second thing is, if I can, oh yeah, uh, the speaker, uh, I believe, was sincere, or he appears to be sincere to me. But not everybody um, in political life and in uh, business life is sincere. In fact, uh, it appears to me there's a lot of insincerity. Uh, I saw Jeff here, I don't know where he went, but anyway, he has talked about this repeatedly. And I really have to say that uh, sincerity is not much of a virtue uh, in a lot of our uh, political and business figures. So um, his, uh, the speaker's system appears to be based on uh, sincerity, that we really want to find out what people believe, and we really want to use government to uh, make things better. Uh, in some ways, uh, that doesn't appear to be true. And in spite of what I just said about the technology, I think uh, that Tim had a point. I did see this uh, story on Estonia. Uh, of course, there's a difference. There's a difference, I think, in the size of countries. I think Estonia, my guess, I didn't, haven't looked this up. My guess is it's three or four or five million people. That's great. Oh, Chicago. About the size of the city of Chicago. It's the size of Chicago, okay. Well, it's the My guess is pretty good then. Right. Okay, you could use this as a lab where you see if this system works. And, of course, uh, it may not, uh, if three million people might be okay, but uh, 300 million people may not be okay. It may not be okay with 300 million people. I've noticed this. The smaller, smaller countries, some of them, some of them, appear to be much more uh, functional. Uh, whether it be uh, Canada with 30 million, or New Zealand with three or four million, uh, they seem to be much more uh, functional than, in some ways, than the United States. So uh, anyway. Uh, I had Tim's uh, point was that I forget. I think I saw that on TV about Estonia. So that's something we ought to watch a little bit. Thank you. Uh, dogs can be very insistent about the things they want. They'll get up and paw their masters and lick them in the face and so forth. And the masters generally give them what they want because they love their dogs. 
But when dogs become too insistent about what they want, it becomes necessary for the masters to take a firm hand and slap the dogs down. I thought Ronald Reagan did a pretty good job of that when he fired the air traffic controllers and when he deregulated the trucking industry. And I just want to say that the time is coming when the dogs will have to be slapped down again. Okay, next. Yeah. All right, first of all, if anything, I think it's the dog owners who need to be slapped down. <laughs> They've caught, they're the ones who are doing most of the barking and have caused quite, quite enough confusion in, in Washington as it is these days. Uh, number two, with regard to the comment that was made earlier about shouldn't we spend more for schools than we do for parks? Actually, we should spend money for both because parks are necessary. They're the way they are in effect a city's lungs. They're how a city breathes. Now granted in Chicago, the Chicago Park District has a habit of spending a lot of money on concrete. Not enough on real parks with trees, grass, flowers, and so on. But to simply stand up here and say, well, we should spend less for parks in general than we do for schools, uh, that's not correct. Uh, uh, for the most part, I agree with the speaker, <clears throat> and I thought most of his ideas were interesting. But having said that, I'm also an old Chicago and Cook County Democrat. And what this has to do with all this is that I'm not entirely sure that I want to completely improve the honesty of the vote. <laughs> A certain amount of irregularity are, irregularities are necessary. <laughs> That's how we keep those damn, them damn Republicans out of city and county government. And that's how we make sure that we never have a Republican mayor again. Or the, wake up someday to find the Republicans are in control of county government. What, the Republicans haven't screwed up the federal government enough as it is? They run well in McHenry County, that's for sure. And, let them, and let them stay in McHenry County, as far as I'm concerned. And DuPage County, too. We don't need them in DuPage. We don't need them in Cook County, period. Right. End of story. Uh, finally, with regard to the comment that was made a few minutes ago about how we should look for sincerity, well, the speaker of that comment sounded a bit like Linus, and this is the kind of year where we recall this story, Linus searching for the next year for the pumpkin patch out of which the great pumpkin will appear. Next year, Charlie Brown will find a pumpkin patch that's really sincere. Thank you. <laughs> Right. An open mic, this is crazy. <laughs> well, the older I get, the less, less flexible I get. So um, all those people that went out of line uh, asking questions during the presentation, um, making statements instead of asking questions. Uh, my own beloved spouse, with whom I have lived and or put up with for many years. <laughs> <laughs> say in the rebuttal period, you couldn't say anything that you want. I mean, that's like really totally atypical for him. Anyway, because he generally says what he wants during the rebuttal period anyway. So um, I guess uh, I just wanted to comment on a few things. One in, in the uh, 2000 election, now you know what, I don't know totally for sure, but Florida was the one I believe that decided that. And that was decided by the woman who was the um, person who was the, the Secretary of State, thank you very much, who was the chairman of the Republican Party there. And um, in a state whose governor was George Bush's brother. So you could probably say that that election was not very honest to begin with. Um, in terms of the voting machines, I absolutely agree with what was said about them. They're totally 
if there, if there isn't a paper trail, there are absolutely, um, they'll, they'll be hacked, period, of an end of sentence. Um, I think that I, I, I really appreciate the uh, speaker's um, concepts about getting input from everybody about what's going on, the issues that are going on. But um, I think that, that you have to deal with the fact that a, a fair amount of the people in this, just even in this city, but certainly in the country, are technologically essentially illiterate. And those of us who do use the internet and all that, a lot of times she's just who's part of it. Like, I don't twit, and I don't um, do LinkedIn, and I, don't, and I rarely do Facebook. Um, I might look at it once a week if that, which is more than a lot of other people do. And, um, and Twitter is just like, wow, why would you, you know, I, I'm just not into that, so there you are. Um, and I'm not that unusual. And the illiteracy goes with social class and it goes with age. Many people my age are not computer literate and, and don't get into it at all, even to go to the library and use it. Although many people do, but many people do not. And many people just can't afford it to begin with. So um, I guess, uh, so I think that um, our speaker is sort of acting like politics is not a contact sport. Well, politics is a contact sport, which means that you don't just get everybody's opinion. You really have to get into it and do it. And I, I you know, just listening to everybody kind of voting the way they want is really nice, but I don't think that that's going to make you a good legislator, essentially, because I think you really have to... Um, work at things a lot harder than that. So um, I'm like um, the uh, I can't even remember who it is. Like my memory is going too. Um, it, you know, I vote for anybody rather than Emmanuel. The the public um, the public uh, forums were for the uh, school system were a total joke because they, they'd already had their minds made up what they were going to do. And you were just there, you know, I went to one and it, like people were seriously in pain, and I'm not kidding, about what was happening to their school, what was happening to their community because of the closing of the schools. And this person who was the flag catcher for the administration was sitting up there and saying, oh yes, we understand, oh yes, we, and nothing is going to be done about it, nothing. So um, they had the hearings because they were required by law, but they, but you know, I don't see, I did not see any changes, despite what the real serious problems that people had with it, with what was happening with the public schools and the issues that were raised there. So you know, a hearing is a hearing is a hearing, and I guess the other thing that. Um, well, I don't know if this is the appropriate forum, but I've been a nurse for almost 40 years, and I really object to many things that Doc Whittard says, including his use of statistics, which is really an error, but um, to say to be kind about it. So um, that's all. Okay. You got your experts. What are your statistics? No medical deaths. A hundred thousand people, not eight hundred thousand people. You got another seven hundred thousand. All right. All right, Jeff. All right. Well, I'm going to pick up on something that Margaret said, but not at the end. Earlier stuff, Jesus. <laughs> When she's talking about politicians and, and, and what makes them be what they be, she was sort of on the right track. But I want to elaborate and ask. I've been studying American politics and political culture for almost 50 years now, ever since, ever since Jack Kennedy was by force of arms removed from office. And <clears throat> I can con I've come to a few conclusions about how it works, particularly in this context. 
Politicians respond for the most part to one of two things. Either campaign contributions or vociferous, especially vociferous organized constituents. Now, when you take out an electric gizmo and you send out some sort of message, in all likelihood you're spitting in the ocean. Except in so far as you make it patently clear that if the politician doesn't vote your way on the given issue, you're going to move heaven and earth to join others to get the politician removed from office. In, the, in other words, in, in which means nowadays, for the most part, politicians respond to pressure groups. And unless there's a way to make this, what you're trying to do here, coalesce, into a group that's going to, people are going to do something more than just send electronic messages. In all likelihood, you're spitting in the ocean. If, for instance, the electronic message is involved, well, the whole bunch of us are going to make a mob, a smart mob, as it's sometimes called, and we're going to assemble in front of the door of the politician's office and make it hard for people to go in or out, or in front of the door of City Hall, all the doors in City Hall, to make it hard for the politicians to go in and out. Unless you're talking about something like that, then you're, the data that comes into the politician about how many people are for this or how many people are against that is going to be chump change. The politicians, they can, insofar as they care, take surveys of the voting public. And there, there's all sorts of polling organizations and this and that taking surveys of the voting public. And that very rarely means anything. It seems to me, indeed, that public opinion just has been counting for overall less and less over the recent decades. Seems like virtually every decade, public opinion counts for less than in the prior one. What the what what they respond to is when you've got more often than not single issue groups that either say we're going to give a bunch of money to your opponent, or we can deliver a bunch of votes for your opponent. All right, if you go there, then you've got something that they'll actually a reasonable chance anyway that they'll pay attention to. But that's about it. Public opinion is just this amorphous and more often than not ill-informed thing anyway. And in the main, I don't know, yeah, is the speaker over there? Mm -hmm. Okay, good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I hope that in due course, you know, you, you, you've got this thing going and you might as well see what you can make of it. But I'll predict to you that in due course, you'll conclude that there's got to be some other course for you to take. You seem like a bright guy, you know, and you know a lot, so, you know, as far as it goes. But it looks like you're spitting in the ocean here. And hopefully at some point, you'll see that you'll try to figure out some other direction where you can go in and make more of a difference than this, because this strikes me as being such a long shot from the st standpoint of making a substantial difference. If you don't mind spitting in the ocean, okay, I guess it may not might be sort of fun to do, but as far as actually affecting things in a way that's gonna matter in a society which is slowly or not so slowly, depending on the point of view, crumbling, Hopefully you'll think of something, you, you seem to have a fair amount of talent and knowledge and so on. Hopefully you'll, you'll, think, you'll be able to think of something else to put your energy into. Because even if the American people responded somehow to what you're trying to do, in the sense of at least that if the politicians actually did listen to what they were saying via this method, my sense of it is that for the most part, what the American people would be telling the politicians are unrealistic things.
the American people, my sense of it is, do not understand the context in which they're operating. You've got the boob tube up there, up there among other things, which is so heavily influencing how they see the world. And the way they see the world, it seems pretty clear to me, is decisively warped. Their expectations of what is going down and their understanding of what has been and is currently going down, from what I can tell, are so seriously flawed that it's just, for the most part, the blind leading the blind. Uh, to get some access. So. All right, let's, uh, let's thank our speaker. Again, wonderful. I know you put in a lot of time and effort on this. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, all right, and he's excited about coming, and thank you for the handouts and detailed. And I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. <coughs> First of all, regarding doc and alternative medicine, which you 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 dislike traditional medicine. You disparage it quite a bit, and you're an advocate of the alternative. But I'm I I I'm, I was thinking of the one woman we spoke here, who said she was the practitioner of alternative medicine, and she gave me a brochure that indicated for I think it was two hundred bucks I could take a course from her and become a doctor in two weeks. <laughs> I think it was a week. <laughs> no, I like to pull with the graduate school a couple times. <laughs> I could have been a doctor, you know, in a week, you know. 200, 200 bucks, you know. Hey, don't even need a government loan, you know, for that one. Uh, come here, come here. Uh, how do I get on click on that one there? Since we're going off this high-tech break with low protest here and hit on the video, just want to show you that what I did this week. I'm tech. I'm a techie, man. There's there's my logo up there. Oh, wow. Make it bigger. Oh, that's okay. There's not much in there. There you go. And there, look at this guy. There he is. <laughs> All right, that's enough of that. Let's get No, it's good enough. <laughs> Anyhow, let's keep rolling here. All right, you want to see it again? All right, one more time. We had a little protest out in the federal class. I lobby for federal employees. And uh, this is uh, this is actually my assistant well, chief store. You can't see it. You're standing. Oh, Charlie, look at my wife Charlie. Oh, there he is. Oh, that's you with the sign. Yeah. yeah. Charlie with the big sign. I'm at the National Federation oh. of Federal Employees. All right. We're gonna do one more. No, no, yeah, no. One more. That's good yeah. enough. Yeah, look at it. It's better. No, it's you're all good. Okay, let's... Wait, 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 let me see No, that's all there is. Oh, okay. All right. Let's see. Let's get let's get on topic here like Frank wants us to do. You wanted to get um, that rat. All right. right up there. Very good initial effort. You put in some time and effort, you show promise. Uh, you obviously advocate pluralism. I don't know if there's a term for it. Um, populism. There can't be any argument against it. Um, I mean, I've been lobbying for 25 years at the federal level at least. Now I started working in the state and a little bit on the city. Uh, you have to look at government logitudinally, however. I mean, it begins with someone declaring their candidacy uh, all the way up until legislation is affected and enacted and assigned to an agency. So it's a complex process. Are there reforms in the thing, certainly in the campaign aspects, uh, the money aspects, things like that? Uh, does this information gathering 
I, does this contribute to the process or not? Um, let's see. That's what I mean. Government is a complex operation. Now, Benjamin Franklin said the people have many heads but no brains. Um, it's difficult to think that the average citizen, not to disparage them, I'm a lefty, but it, it's a complex operation very much affected by professionals on a full-time basis. And I, I don't know if I can give a lot to the opinions of the uninformed. Um, it's, we have legislative assemblies and they do work pretty assiduously and there's a lot going on. Um, to say that the average citizen is going to make any great contribution to this, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know that they're not doing so already. In the sense that issues, um, to segregate issues and have all the relevant articles on the internet probably be very useful. I mean, in the form of the electorate. Um, the, the thing I was looking at your list, granted it's an initial list, where there certainly are a lot of significant omissions. You don't have anything regarding labor law, as if it doesn't exist. Each of us works every day, or a good many of us, at least until the recession. Uh, that's, you know, something you might want to look at. Another area you want to check on this, it's somewhat done a little bit already. I used to subscribe to this. It's, you might want to look it up, called VIS, the Voter Information Service. Uh, like my union, we track legislation already during the course of a, a congressman's career, things like that. There are many associations that do about 80 main ones. So you can look up an issue already and ascertain how your representative has been voting on that issue. And I used to subscribe to this and may go back to it again. And it tracks all of these, like my union, the labor organization. When there's a labor vote, we see how they're doing. And we can track it. And when I lobby with them, I say, you, you guys aren't like voting our way too much. No, they're just general things. They're not absolutes. Uh, the other thing about government, a lot of government is appropriations. It's boring, it's financial, it's not these hot issues that you can just grab onto. Uh, that's how they trick people, the Republicans in particular, by putting for hot issues. And then you forget about everything else. A lot of government, okay, who's gonna, like here, I'm building a railroad. First question I get, how are you gonna pay for it? That's what I've gotta have the answers for. Um, like, here's another example. You had a thing on your sheet that you want to put new L stations. L stations are $40 million each. It's just not a snap of the fingers that you get these things. You want a hundred of them? That's not that, my, that's current legislation. That's, that's not my legislation. Yeah, but I mean, that's the whole budget of CTA. That's a manual <laughs> Double. <laughs> it, 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 that's what I mean. Where are we at on this thing? Um, give in rebuttal here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, now another one I looked at here, an ideal life. I, I, but I also want to make, I'm going to send an email out. There's a meeting of the United Nations Association coming up. You have foreign affairs. This is an incredibly complex area, equal to legislation. There are about a thousand treaties out there. And all these little countries, a state department with a desk on each country or region, I, I, whether or not you're going to have people getting into this minutia, what are they going to be doing? Uh, and last of all, regarding this issue of voting, I make voting, I'm sorry, I'm a little old school with Dave here. Voting should be uh, the best people only, and make it, I don't think you should make it easy. It's just like the old Democrats, they, it's the, Dedicated people who are concerned about it. And if we all this thing, what are we value? Actually, the really the voting thing, we're gonna take this up next week. Even electronic voting, 
is not going to bring everybody to the polls. I, the latest figures I've had, and I'm on the conference thing, it's only going to increase about 10%, I think. Uh, so it, this idea that you're going to have all this voting very easy is not going to materialize. I don't know why that is, but I'd have to check again. But the results, if you remove all the barriers, you don't get a significant automatic jump in the voting increase and things like that. Now regarding parks and schools, I don't think I've been in a park in Chicago in years. And I haven't gone to elementary school, obviously. So I don't think they're very important at all, either one. Thank you. But come again when you develop this. Come back in six months. All right, we have some fun here. We still have open slots, Rom. I think it's time for our, our speaker to rebut. All right. Okay. Yay. Good. All right, so there were a lot of questions there. I'm going to try to keep this short and sweet. Um, I think the biggest thing that I'm trying to get across here is that we're all hypnotized right now by a political game. Everybody can talk about politics. I've been watching it for 100 years, 200 years. It's always been the same. Does it need improvement? Is it actually working? That's the question. If it worked, it would be working. We would not be in a shutdown. It would be working in the sense for even Chicago public schools, if you ask about qualifications as a legislator. If I'm asking for teachers and parents' opinions, even though I'm still in the same old legislative process, but I'm asking for their opinions in an organized way, how does that not make me a better candidate than somebody who would not ask? So I think it's important to really take home the point that it's legislatively acknowledged, not just LinkedIn, not platforms that are already used. If it's good enough for Estonia, why isn't it good enough for the United States? I believe, that, I believe, the, people, I believe the people in each state in the United States can come up with a solid system that they believe in and that they trust. Again, it's not a one system platform of the federal government saying use this, which is the current voting system right now, which is why nobody believes in voting results, paper or electronic. Nobody believes in them. They all think they're skewed. They all think they're biased for whatever reason. But it starts at, and, and to your point about starting with small population, it starts on a, on a local scale. Even if you were to do it in a small aspect of just being a, uh, elderly or disabled folks, allowing them to virtual vote. Why not? So um, in terms of uh, things starting with the average citizen, I, I take that insulting. You know, I mean, I do think that people do have a right to at least express themselves and have it legislatively acknowledged and counted transparently. I think just to dismiss them as uneducated is, is absurd and it's short-minded and short-sighted. Um, if you look at women's rights, if you look at child labor rights, and, and again, the, the website's only five months old, um, not even really, I started, I actually went live a month ago on the actual domain. Um, but I'm adding all of those things into the civil rights areas, the employment, I mean, I didn't get to get into the um, uh, No Child is Invisible Act, which is something we're going to push forward, which is relating to military child identifiers. Right now, if you go into a school, they can't even tell you which children are related to anybody that's currently deployed, which affects their mental and health, uh, mental well-being, emotional well-being, and so on. Um, that alone, too, to me, is something that can be done locally and, and you know, trial it, trial it in that form. Um, but I think it, the irony in looking at the protest is, the question is, was it effective? How do you know if people even, how do you know legislators weren't laughing at that protest? If you had a way that they would have it as basically acknowledged transparently, yeah, these people came out, yeah, they all disagree with this person in office, whatever it is, and you have that transparent, then you know it's tangible that they, they have actually uh, looked at your concerns, as opposed to just look out the window or just turn the, turn the other way and just say, there's people protesting over there, I didn't even know. So again, take on the fact that it's legislatively acknowledged voting, public opinion voting, the virtual voting concept, 
Again, it can be a supplementation. If you want to use paper, use paper. But I challenge you to look at the auditing and, and the, I mean, look at online banking. The irony also is look at everybody signing up for the Affordable Care Act and they're willing to give up all this information about themselves, but they're not willing to validate themselves in a way that they can virtually vote with that same information. Anybody can fill out paper. Any truck can magically disappear full of paper ballots, which happens all the time. But if you have electronic validation, again, as soon as you post your vote, look at five different third party, you know, rotating what I'd like to see is rotating third party oversight to make sure that, yeah, it's indeed this person's vote. And if, if there's any question, have each state system come up with a way to make it objectively, as objective as possible, make it believable, because right now it is not believable. So the question is, do you just give up? Or do you try to contribute things that will help improve what we're really all asking for, and that is to live our own lives, but to have some sense of security in government and reliability in government. So I thank you all for your time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.